Democrats spent millions trying to influence the Republican parties. How badly did it backfire? In all the years we have focused on school safety, a group of kids haven't always been included. A group of local therapists are preparing to scale up because they're already seeing the mental health impacts of overturning Roe v. Wade. No online service during the Avalanche Victory Parade on June 30th. I dare say the rest of us are a bit more excited about the Avs, even if this is what you're listening to on your way to the parade. Congratulations, Avalanche. That's next. Five and a half million dollars down the drain. Democrats spent at least that much on TV ads. Ads that were trying to get Republican primary voters to pick super conservatives. Greg Lopez for governor, Ron Hanks for U.S. Senate. That strategy backfired. Not only did those candidates lose soundly yesterday, but it made their primary opponents seem more moderate, which could benefit Republicans in November. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Before running for Senate as a Republican, O'Day actually supported Democrats. Democrats paid millions to promote U.S. Senate candidate Joe O'Day as too moderate. How conservative is Ron Hanks? And candidate Ron Hanks as too conservative. Their hope was to get Hanks through to November, so Democratic Senator Michael Bennett might have an easier election. It was a clear attempt to hijack a primary, and I think it, it backfired in a significant way. Josh Penry is a strategist for the Joe O'Day campaign. He admits the four plus million dollars on campaign ads trying to meddle in the Republican primary made it a closer race than they thought. It was effective. I mean, the, the primary was not competitive four weeks ago, and so they definitely succeeded in, you know, in making the, the race more competitive, forcing us to spend more resources. It forced the O'Day campaign to pivot to unaffiliated voters. Former Republican State Representative Rob Whitwer, now unaffiliated, wrote about this tactic in his 2010 book with former Nine News political reporter Adam Schrager. Twelve years later, he points out the Democratic spending may have actually benefited O'Day. They have defined him as the moderate in this race. Uh, before the primary was even over, and it's going to be a problem for them going into November. Now we have a better idea of who Joe O'Day is. Um, so he earned, he got a lot of earned media that he otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Mario Nicholas is a former Republican turned unaffiliated. In a column for the Colorado Sun, he warned about trying to help fringe candidates win on the idea it would be easier for Democrats in November. You know, I think Democrats thought they're going to use a little reverse psychology 101. And the Republican, uh, the Republican elector was too smart for that. And in the case of O'Day, Democrats may have paid for ads that were supposed to work against him yesterday, but for him in November. And they spent tons of money highlighting the fact that Joe had given to Hick and, and Bennett before. And those are all things that will benefit Joe in the general election. This same tactic happened in the governor's race. Two conservative ads for Greg Lopez funded by the Democratic Governors Association. I asked the Democratic Governors Association today about the wasted $1.5 million spent on those ads. The response I got was calling Republican nominee Heidi Ganahl too extreme and radical. So then, Anusha, I asked, if you thought she's too extreme and radical, how come you also didn't pay for ads that said that leading up to the primary? to which I've got no response. All right, so we were just talking about this, right? So the, the candidates at the party pick were the first name that you see on the ballot, most of them lost. Does that mean that that process needs to be revisited? I asked that to the people I interviewed today, and the short answer is it's in state statute how we pick candidates, so it would have to be a, a state law change. But yeah, the, the first name you see on the ballot went through the convention and caucus process and got right. the support from party insiders. And when everyone's involved, a, in this year, they chose widely different than when the, the select few people that help pick candidates. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it's worth the discussion. Do we need to change the way we pick our candidates? All right. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Marshall. Well, from 34 votes to 373 votes, the Democratic race for Colorado House District 6 just got wider and then flipped who's in the lead. Progressive Democrat Elizabeth Epps and centrist Democrat Katie March are vying for that seat that's representing East Central Denver. As of Denver's 5 o'clock update, Epps is leading March by 373 votes. This is out of automatic recount territory. Also includes ballots counted after polls closed last night. So there are some ballots that did have signature issues. There were 39 of them. It's normal. Denver has seven days to work with those voters on a fix. Another update is expected tomorrow afternoon. 
Well, the bumpy lawsuit-ridden ride that was a Republican ticket for Colorado's 21st House District down in Fountain ended a lot smoother than it started. Incumbent State Representative Mary Bradfield won the Republican nomination last night. Bradfield was running against Carl Dent, but she originally wasn't even on the ballot. Delegates originally gave that spot to Dent, which then led to a lawsuit claiming some delegates were not allowed to vote, while another shouldn't have been included at all. Bradfield ended up getting 66% of the votes last night. About 34% went to Dent. She is going to be running against Democrat Colton Montgomery come November. So want to take a moment to give a recommendation here. From time to time, right, we like to point you to something that isn't ours, but we think is worth your time and energy. Well, more than a dozen candidates running for sheriff in Colorado seem to be running on a platform of not enforcing the law. The Colorado Sun's Shannon Najmabadi has an in-depth article on this that has since been picked up by the Associated Press. The article is detailing how candidates fit the profile of what's being called constitutional sheriffs who promise to protect against government overreach and laws they deem illegal. Some of those candidate campaigns, those are done, others just getting started. If you look at the races for sheriff in Douglas County and El Paso County, so in Dugco, it's too close to call right now, but three out of the four Republicans on the ballot, John Anderson, Holly Kluth, and Laura Thomas, have spoken about protecting the Constitution and government overreach. In El Paso County, gun restrictions, mandates like masks and vaccines are also at the top of Republican candidates' minds. Republican frontrunner and current undership Sheriff Joey Royball says his views are largely similar to his appointments, but according to uh, uh, to his opponents, excuse me, but according to the article, is considering constitutional sheriff as more of a branding catchphrase. So Shannon Najmabadi's article is a thorough and really interesting look at some of the people looking to be the top law enforcement officers, including in more rural areas of Colorado. If you're interested in taking a look at the full article, we have posted a link to it on the next Facebook page. For all of the years that we have focused so closely on school safety and what to do if someone with a gun walks into a classroom, there's a group of kids that are at risk of falling through a security gap. We're talking about children with special needs, and now parents have come up with a program that Colorado families can access tonight. You can constantly hear parents, educators, what about this student? The answer Michelle gave, the executive director of Safe and Sound Schools Together has to give. People will do the best they can. Is not acceptable to her. We learned very painfully that, you know, that is not a, a plan. So she authored her own training for kids and staff with special needs, an entire safety program crafted with her Josephine in mind. Um, she loved school. She loved her people. Josephine was a child with a lot of special needs. Autism, apraxia, um, she was nonverbal. The program called Especially Safe is for Josephine, a victim in the Sandy Hook school shooting. She's just so very much with us in the work that we do, and especially in this program. The program is built to get schools and communities to think about individual kids and staff, whether it's someone in a wheelchair or has specific medical needs. She would have needed her iPad. She would have needed her PEX cards to be able to point to and communicate with staff who couldn't run or hide or fight or or do the typical things that, you know, a, a typical child might be able to to do in a crisis. But there are numerous stories out there about, you know, special education students in a wheelchair being left behind in a drill because they didn't think to plan, how am I going to get this child from the second story? Multiple states, including Colorado, are now adopting the program. It'll be available to every school district here for free and is already online. It was also developed with money from the Jeff Co. DeAngelis Foundation. You know, not only train the teachers, but it also trains the students. And those at the forefront of school safety, like Frank DeAngelis, says a program like this is a sign of lessons learned. Time goes on, you make modifications uh, that what works and what does not work. So there are so many facets to this, like planning for kids where English may be their second language, having someone who knows sign language around, and in the same way that some kids have individual education plans, this would be an individual safety plan. It's going to be rolled out in Jeffco first come this fall, and then the hope is to spread to other districts after that.
Kyle will be back tomorrow from some well-deserved time off, but does he ever really take a day off? Here he is with a new word of thanks. You know, believe it or not, even in this job market, there are Coloradans who want to work who are having difficulty finding employment. Three in 10 Coloradans have some barrier to employment. And that's why this week's Word of Thanks campaign features Mile High Workshop. They're a nonprofit in Denver that works with those Coloradans who have barriers to employment, whether they're coming out of incarceration or addiction or homelessness. These are neighbors who want to work but might have trouble getting a traditional employer to take a chance on them. So Mile High Workshop has a contract production facility. They do work for a lot of brand names that you and I know, and that's work that's done by our neighbors who are trying to reestablish a firm footing in their lives. When they succeed, their families succeed, and our community is stronger. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you the link to donate. We know that even $5 matters. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5 that comes in. Mile High Workshop is that first step back into the workforce for Coloradans who desire that productive aspect of life, but have something standing in their way. With our help, they can succeed. Some mental health providers are changing the way they operate after Roe v. Wade was overturned. All of our cloud-based platforms are HIPAA protected already, and they have choicefulness in what they want to disclose. The Colorado Avs hit the streets tomorrow, but will Mother Nature rain on the parade? And it's a sign that doesn't look particularly appealing, but something added it to the menu anyway. Next. There's a mental health group that is scaling up, preparing for more people who would need help after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Kesson Wellness is now fundraising to provide free sessions to as many people as money allows. They said the ripple effect is already being felt, including here in Colorado, where abortion access is protected by state law. A woman could have gotten, or a birthing person, could have gotten abortion in the past. Um, and this whole experience is bringing up a lot of trauma. What I can also tell you as a non-binary person is that there's greater fear in marginalized queer communities, also communities of color who are already more impacted medically and also uh, trans people in particular are already experiencing legislation in other states that are threatening rights. Kesed Wellness is based here in Colorado, but it also has a national presence, including in states that are restricting access to abortions. They're planning on helping people both in and out of state. So we asked our legal expert, can getting help navigating a pregnancy or abortion tip off authorities and potentially expose someone to legal troubles? So the short answer is no, that is not a crime to do basic research on your own reproductive health issues and, and things related even to an abortion. Could it be used if a, an aggressive prosecutor tried to go after somebody and they sought the discovery and they sought the computer forensics? Maybe, but that is a very remote situation. All of our cloud-based platforms are HIPAA protected already and they have choicefulness in what they want to disclose. So what Heather was talking about there is that a person can share as little or as much as they want in an intake form so that it could be harder to connect the dots. Our legal expert also said that he's really first expecting litigation about people crossing state line for services, sending medication across state lines, and people helping someone getting an abortion. And while they haven't seen an uptick right now, Colorado Crisis Services says they are ready to help for either Roe v. Wade or, or any situation. They are available 24-7 by phone. That number is 844-493-8255. You can also text the word TALK to 38255. A cloudy afternoon and evening across the Front Range. If you were lucky, maybe you saw a couple of light little showers across parts of the metro area. We do have another shot within the next couple of hours to see a bit more rain move through. I just put on the lightning tracker 
just shy of 200 strikes within the past about 15 minutes time. Most of those centered across the northern and central mountains. A good batch just to the south of uh, 285 toward Bailey. Here in the metro area, just mostly cloudy skies. But again, as we look at the future cast, this is going to take us till about 10 p.m. tonight. Still will be unsettled with a little bit of rain, perhaps even a lightning show coming our way late tonight. Overnight, the clouds will be with us. And that's the way we wake up on our uh, Thursday. Thursday about 10 o'clock, we're talking about the parade. It does look dry. However cloudy to kick off the day and then by 1 2 o'clock I'll be watching these scattered showers moving across the I-25 corridor heavier rain showers by about 10 11 o'clock tomorrow night temperatures at least for step off right there at 10 a.m. in the lower 80s partly to mostly cloudy skies it will be a bit cooler for us here in the metro but still 90s off to the eastern plains with 60s primarily up in the mountains the storms return Friday and Saturday but they will turn more isolated as temperatures warm into the 90s as we look ahead toward the 4th of July holiday Today they prep, tomorrow they parade. And no alarm service during the Avalanche Victory Parade on June 30th. RTD is getting ready too. Next. Oh, the parade and the party preps are on across downtown Colorado, ready to celebrate our Stanley Cup champs. Even RTD joining the hype. Congratulations, Avalanche. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That was the message. RTD says it plays every three minutes. It does eventually update line closures and other information related to tomorrow's parade. Nine News is number one Avs fan and somebody who was probably sound more enthusiastic about this. Steve Steger first noticed the shout out this morning. Quick reminder, the parade is starting at 10, but the fun and the celebrations start at 9. It's a sign that someone or something really sunk their teeth into. We're really hoping it's a thing, otherwise this would be a little bit weird. Brenda sent us this sign from a campground in Cheyenne Mountain State Park. A nice long list of what might attract bears, decorated with plenty of well-placed teeth marks. Whatever was chewing this up, you could still read the list, so I guess that's considered at the very least. If you see a great sign, you can email us next at 9news.com or get our attention on hit Twitter with the hashtag HeyNext. We've got another chance to help Coloradans who are looking for work in this week's micro giving campaign. That and your feedback next. For Coloradans who have a barrier to employment, like past incarceration or, or substance abuse or homelessness, they can get into this cycle where it's difficult to hold and keep a job and then they can fall back into those patterns that they're trying to escape. The nonprofit Mile High Workshop is one possible solution, providing transitional work for folks to establish a, a job record, something that they can take to a future employer where they've done real contract production work in our community and that allows them to step into that next stage of life. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in supporting Mile High Workshop in support of our neighbors who want to work. They just need the opportunity. Mitchell wrote in about planning for school safety for kids with special needs, saying that physical therapists need to be included. Mitchell, you are right on point here. This is the exact kind of thing parents are really hoping all of us will start considering. So thank you so much for writing back and thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time.